For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11, dear fellow redeemed. Uh, without a doubt, that is one of the most cherished verses in all the Bible, and, and rightly so, uh, so. These verses have brought so much comfort to God's children throughout the years. And, and there's four words that just jump out at a person when they read this. It's saying that God knows, God has a plan, that he has a plan for you, and it's, it's going to be a good plan. It's going to be a great plan, a plan in which you prosper from. What that assures us of is God knows what's going on. God knows what's going on. He knows what's going to happen to you, and he knows the direction of your life. And when you get off path, and, and we do that, we do that, the Lord is telling us he's going to bring us back on path because he has a plan. What's so noticeable then about Jeremiah twenty nine eleven is what this verse is not saying. Almost what it's not saying is more striking than what it's saying. And what it's not saying is that your plans are what God is going to follow. It's about God's plans. This is a total biblical truism. In fact, oftentimes God's plan interrupts the plan that we have about how life should go or what should happen. And, and you read the Bible, and this is kind of a theme, isn't it? I'm sure Noah did not plan on building a large vessel that he could turn into a floating zoo and spend a year floating around and then be one of eight people on the face of the earth. That was not his plan. Certainly, Abraham did not plan to up and move away from his entire family, especially in a culture that stayed in the area their family was from, and then have a son at 75 years of age with his wife, Sarah. And it wasn't Moses' plan to go in front of the most powerful man in the world at that time and demand a huge piece of his economical workforce to be handed over to him and to do this at 80 years old. And of course, it wasn't David's plan to be king, Mary's plan to be the mother of the Lord Jesus, Paul's plan to be the greatest missionary outside of Jesus. You get the idea here. God's plans are often not our plans. In fact, we could probably say this. God's plans often interrupt our plans. They interrupt them. And so this is another great truth that Jeremiah 29 is bringing to our attention. It's not what we have planned. It's what God has planned. It's not what we have going on in our life or what we want going on in our life. It's what God wants to happen in our life and what God is going to have happen. And so another truism is discovered here. And this truism truism is this. Oftentimes, it's not till we fail at our plan that we stop and then consider what God's plan is. It isn't until our plans have crashed down around us that we say, oh God, okay, I guess now I'll listen to you. Maybe your plan is better than mine. God doesn't do things according to my plan. He doesn't do things that always make sense to me, especially in the moment. Yet, if if Jesus is the all-powerful God, then he must be great enough and powerful enough to have a reason for allowing the certain things to happen in my life or to let me go through things, even if I don't understand why I'm going through them. The all-powerful, all-wise God has a reason for it. And this all-powerful, all-wise God also has this unbound love for us that he promises to make things that are good and right happen to us. In fact, the best things will happen to us, even if bad things are happening now, he has greater and better things in store for us. This is the promise of the God that knows and has a plan for us and where we should go. This truth, we need to hear this. They needed to hear this in Jeremiah. All Christians love to hear this truth. It's very relevant. So today... We're going to take some time, and we're going to look at Jeremiah 29, 11, but we're also going to look and expand the context of Jeremiah 29, 11, because as we study the context of it, we realize how fascinating these words and how striking they very much are to the people that God was speaking to as they are to us. So with that in mind, I invite your attention to Jeremiah 29. We'll pick it up in verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. 
Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and the diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me where you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So far, the very words of our gods, the words of our God, we give these words their due reverence because they are the very true words that God himself shares with us knowing that they are always now and will be worthy of our full attention. To that we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. Now, I said that these are striking words, and oftentimes when we consider Jeremiah 29, 11, we do, we take it out of the context and we put it on the cover of bulletins or little uh, passage reminders, and that, that's, that's fitting. You can do that universally applies to all of us and and how the Lord truly does have plans for us. I mean, evident in that verse and throughout the entirety of Scripture. Yet, when we take these words and we put them right back in the context, something very, very striking is happening here. And again, worthy of our time to talk about. Now, just a a little history, and don't fall asleep. This will not be a long, boring history lesson. But rather, you'll see how striking it is what God is saying to us in that at this point in time, the Babylonians were the the superpower of the region, and their war machine had come in and and destroyed Jerusalem and carried off people. Now, prior to that, for more than 100 years, the northern kingdom had already been taken off and taken over by Assyria. And when that happened, as the years rolled on, Jeremiah came to the southern kingdom of Judah, and he had this job that nobody wants. He had to come to them and say, guys, if we don't repent of our sins, if God does not become the affection of our hearts, if our allegiance isn't to the true God and not given to these other things, the same thing is going to happen to us. Nobody likes to hear that. Ill news is an ill guest and always has been and always will be. So Jeremiah calls to them and he says, your unfaithfulness to God is so striking and so devastating, it's like prostitution. It's like Adultery. This is destroying you. It's destroying the nation. It's destroying people. But again, they weren't listening. And so he said, God is displeased and he will use a foreign power to come in and smite us. Well, the people didn't listen. Jeremiah kept talking. And finally, the Babylonian war machine came in, took over the city, pounded down their armies, dismantled them. God said it would happen. And so it happened. One of the things the Babylonians liked to do is they would take what they considered the best and the brightest of the people somewhere in the neighborhood, maybe close to at least 1,000 to 10,000 people then were taken, and they were taken off to Babylon to be assimilated into that culture. And then they would take the remaining people, a huge percentage of them, and scatter them throughout the rest of the empire so that they could form their bonds together as a community and a culture and, and rise up against them. So what happens then is Jerusalem being taken over and crushed, another terrible thing happened to them. Their whole culture was completely thrown in disarray because the temple, which we cannot overstate what that meant to them at that time, was destroyed. And they were taken out of their homeland to a city that they hated, and they had to live with this insecurity, all the people back at the city here, wondering, are we going to be scattered to the north, to the east, to the south? We hope not the west, because that's the Mediterranean. What is going to happen to us? So there was all this insecurity. People were frightened about what the future holds. And to make matters worse then, while this insecurity was brewing on the people in exile in Babylon and the people remaining in the Jerusalem area, there came false teachers. And the false teachers came in and they said, hold on, it's going to be okay. You see, in, um, let's see, uh, two years, God will bring 
the people back, and we will be a nation again, and we will be great, and it'll be awesome, and we'll have houses, and it'll be wonderful. Chapter 28 talks to one of the main false teachers, which was a man by the name of Hananiah. He came and said these things would happen. Now, Jeremiah then, and we have to give Jeremiah some credit here. He did not want to be the bearer of bad news. And Jeremiah would have loved for that to be true. That, yeah, two years, we'll all be back together again. But the Lord delivered a very different message to Jeremiah, and he was to go correct this misunderstanding that was being promoted in the Jerusalem area and then also to those in captivity over in Babylon. And the message was simply this, no, not in two years will God bring you back. In fact, it's going to be 70 years. It's going to be a long time. So then the Lord instructed Jeremiah, this is what I want you to say. And now it gets very striking. Verse 4 of 29. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried off from Jerusalem to Babylon. Right away, God is saying, I carried you off. This is not some superior war machine that I can't control. I'm God. I control everything. I allowed them to come and get you and to take you off for particular reasons. I'm the controller of all things. I allow things to happen. I bring the good things in the lives of these people, and I allowed them to take you away. Know that. Then he says something else, very striking and very shocking, and this is where we get to 5, 6, and 7. He says this. To those of you in captivity, build houses, settle down, plant a garden, eat what you produce, Get married. Have lots of kids. Increase in your numbers. Have your kids get married. And seek the shalom, or we translate it peace, and it's not just a a, a cessation of fighting, but it's a very holistic idea of, of flourishing fulfillment for everyone. Seek the peace, and then we have here prosperity is put into the translation as well, which carries that further idea of the shalom idea that you, you prosper. So not just peaceful times, but that the city, the city that you're in exile, that it prospers and everyone around you. Pray to God for the city. Now, you've got to almost imagine when this letter came in to those in exile and they're reading this and they're like, oh, the prophet Jeremiah, what does he have to say? What? Is he joking? Except for Jeremiah was a very sober, somber kind of man. I don't think joking was a thing he did often. So the people look at this and they're saying, this is Babylon. This is enemy number one. This is like your favorite baseball player being traded to the Yankees and you're supposed to go, yes, go New York. Nobody does that in their right mind, unless you're from New York. The children of Israel here are taken to an exile land that they don't want to be at, surrounded by heathens, surrounded by fragmented parts of other cultures, all there with different beliefs and different values. And the instruction from God is pray that they prosper and have peace. What? So we have to continue to look at this. We have to continue to say what God is saying. And then we stop. Well, what is God saying to us? Because we can kind of find some of these similarities. We're not forced here by an opposing army, but we do live in a land that is coming increasingly drifting, let's say, from Jesus, the Messiah, and the truths of the Bible, that is becoming more and more fragmented with different beliefs and different cultural values, what is God saying to us in that situation? Very relevant to what he was saying to them. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with this? There's, of course, ways to deal with that, and they were doing this at that time. There were separatists among the exiles in Babylon that were basically holding up and, and creating this hedge around themselves, creating all kinds of barriers to make it known we are not part of it. We're here, and we have to live in this city, and we have to go to school, and we have to work here, but we're not part of you. And you're going to see it in how we act and how we dress and where we live and all those different ways. This is one way of doing it. They lived even outside of the city quite a ways. In Jesus' time, the Pharisees were very, very much a part of that kind of thinking. They dressed and acted apart from everyone else, especially the Roman culture that dominated the areas they were, of course, being governed by Rome at that time. But Jeremiah is saying this. He's saying this to the people then, and he's saying this to us today. He's saying, be part of your city. Be part of your community. Take your gifts and your talents and be part of it. Don't separate yourself, but rather be part of it because everyone will thrive when your gifts and your talents are used for everyone. And if you think about it, isn't this the message Jesus gives us on the Sermon on the Mount when he talks about the city on the hill? 
and Christians being salt and light that go into the world and salt things that are lights of God in there. To be part of the culture, be part of the city, be part of the people around you and in your life, not just your own group. Don't just pick your own group and say, I will benefit this group and be part of this group. That's not what he's saying. Rather, all people, the reference of the city, what happens is they see how you live. They see the way you act. They see the way you process reality. And the way we live, the way we think and act, the way we process reality is through Jesus. And we want that to point back to Jesus, hence the light that points back to the Father in heaven Jesus talked about. They see the city, the people of the city, what makes us different, and that's Jesus. That's what makes us different. Jesus gives us the power to love others. Why can we love others unconditionally, open ourselves up, Because we've been loved by Jesus. We know, we have that kind of security when we go into a situation, when we meet new people or people we've known. We know that we're loved. We're loved by Jesus. Jesus gives us the power to be patient with people because Jesus is patient with us. Extremely patient with us. Jesus gives us the power to forgive people. We can forgive, and it's hard to forgive, especially those who hurt us deeply, but we can forgive through Christ the Savior. And you think about it. Think of how we hurt Christ with our sins. We put him on the cross, and he forgives us. Think of all the times, the things we didn't do that we're supposed to do, and Jesus forgives us because of that. We can forgive. We get this from Jesus. So is this what Jesus is saying? Then assimilate and be absolutely part of whatever city or culture you live around. Basically, the old saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans. Is, is that what we're learning here from the Bible? Uh, no, no. Let's paraphrase Paul. Paul once talked about how we are not to conform to the world, but transform into the image of God. He's saying that we're part of the world, yes, but we are not of the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Again, that means that we're part of the world and we process things through our eyes of faith. Think of the big three things in culture. You cannot stand in the supermarket and look at a row of magazines and not have one of, if not all three of these things basically put in your face. Uh, Sex, money, power. Our culture values these things. They see them as a means to power, as a means to fame, as a means of being accepted by other people, as a means to feel good. Basically, people, how can they serve you? What can I get from you? What can you do for me? This is a very sinful world way of looking at people and things. That's not how believers in Jesus look at the world. That's not how we process the world. We view sex, money, and power not as what we can get, but what we can give. We can give because God is so freely given to us. So we don't assimilate to the culture and the world around us. We don't share their views. Rather, the kingdom of God is first. And with the kingdom of God being first, then we can become productive parts of the world and the culture that we live in. In fact, in all reality, we should be the best of citizens. The best neighbor, the best worker. Why can you be the best worker? Because you treat your job not as something to get money from, but as a calling that God has given you in all that you do in your profession, you do to the glory of God. We should be the best neighbors because we look out for them. We want what's best for them, knowing that God has taken care of what's best for us. How can we then better serve them? The world needs us. This is why Jesus sends us out into the city. This is why we are the salt. Why the light? The world needs us. The city needs to see the faith, the hope, the confidence that lives in us of the God who takes care of us, not just in this life, but into the everlasting life as well. Sometimes we show that. We show that when we show our priorities. We show that in how we handle the adversities that are so much part of life in a sinful world. We even show that in how we handle the good times. And things are going well for us. We show it in humility, knowing that our sins are forgiven in in Christ who loves us. And again, you look at Jesus. He came to this this hostile world. Jesus, who who never sinned, he, he didn't break any law of God. In fact, he did everything that a perfect man was supposed to do, a perfect person. Jesus didn't give offense to people. Now, people were offended to him. Yes, they were offended by him. Because of their own sinful pride and arrogance, they took exception to the way Jesus behaved. But everything Jesus did, the way he thought, talked, did not take glory from God, but rather point it to the Father in heaven. He brought people to the Father in heaven. That was his job, to reconnect the world back to the Father. So Jesus was part of the community. 
For many years, he had a job. He was a carpenter. Then for three years, he, his public ministry where he performed great wonders and miracles and he taught with such great authority, he was even confronted by the Pharisees again who were the ultimate separatists. They were setting the traps for Jesus. Oh, if you're one of us, then what do you think about taxes? And remember Jesus' answer. Give to Caesar what is Caesar, but to God what is God's. And the Herodians, who were also the, the, the progressives, if you will, the conformists to the culture of that time, they also conspired with the Pharisees to get rid of Jesus because he was such a nuisance to them. So what Jeremiah is saying to these people is so clearly to us. Be part of the city where you are because God loves you, because God is in control of your life, even if, if it doesn't look like it right now. Even if you're not where you want to be, God is with you and he will bless you. Jeremiah instructs then in chapter, or verse 12, he goes on. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. So he's saying, pray to me too. Look for me. And where do we look for God? We look for God in his word. There the Lord reveals himself. There the Lord shows himself in his, his will to us. So Jeremiah is saying this, pray to God. Don't pray like you're going to a restaurant and placing an order. You know, God, if I would get a lot of money or if I was healthier, then my life would be better and I'd be really happy and I think that's your plan for me. So God, let's uh, serve it up. No, no. Jeremiah is saying pray in humility and this confidence and trust that God is in control and that he has a plan for you and he will take care of you. And this is what we see with Jesus, again, who left the perfect city of heaven and came down to the fallen city of earth and took on our sins for us. He took banishment from the Father so we would never be banished. He comes to us and gives us the ability to live here where we're called and be light and salt in the world. His name then we pray. Father, we ask that you be with us and that you would bless us and that we'd have absolute confidence that you do have a plan for us and this plan is good and wonderful. And we ask that you would move us to walk in it and trust in it. And if we get off, Lord, path, that you would bring us back. In your name we pray.